My name is Spencer Miller. I was lucky enough to be born and raised in Florida. The salt water practically runs through my blood. But in contrast to the emerald water, lays a much darker side of the state. what you haven't seen today? Life. All the devastation you just witnessed can be traced back to one special interest group in Florida. The middle of Florida historically had never been a good place to grow anything, even sugarcane. That is, until humans figured out how to use Lake Okeechobee, the second largest lake in the lower 48, to their advantage. Its waters are now controlled to yield the perfect sugar crop through a series of dams, year after year. In the 7,000 years before the sugar industry got hold of Florida's waterways, rain during the wet summer months would fall in the Kissimmee River Basin and trickle south. The lake below would then start to fill and eventually spill over its southern edge, sending vast sheets of water ever so slowly down into the Everglades, which was then a river about 60 miles wide and less than a yard deep. Average speed of the water, a few inches per minute, like a glacier. And by the time the dry winter season rolled around, the flow would still be making its way into Florida Bay and the Keys to prevent hypersaline conditions. The slow-moving river found an almost impossible balance between Florida's immense and variable rainfall. But you know where this is going. Humankind, especially in the 40s and 50s dam building rage, didn't like things they couldn't control. Everything was lovely in Florida, so it seemed. The sun was kind, the surf was fresh, the beaches white and clean. To millions of Americans, it was Valhalla, the nation's playtime paradise, the place where all was right and nothing was wrong. So it seemed. But once you got past the surf and the shore, the glittering jewel face of the side hard by the sea, there was trouble. Nature was frowning. The trouble was water. Too much of it on one hand, not enough of it on the other. When the rains came, they inundated the flat lowlands of central and southern Florida, overfilling the inland waters. Millions of dollars being flooded away, a great treasure literally buried in its own silent grave. People wanted to settle and farm the middle of the state. And so they had to dam the river. This monster had to be controlled by bigger levees and by bigger canals that would give it bigger outlets to the sea. The pattern was set. All that had to be done was build the reservoirs, the channels, the levees, the spillways, the pumping stations, the gates, the saltwater barriers, the whole integrated system of water controls. That's all. The engineers went to work. And the glades flow changed forever the only river of its kind in the world, was replaced by a series of concrete canals to the south and two rivers that had nothing to do with the original system to the east and west. Human intervention worked on one hand, as it allowed for massive coastal development and 700,000 acres of mostly subsidized sugar farms to live under the lake. 
but when you replumb a 7,000 year old system, you're bound to screw up somewhere. The South, Florida Bay and the Keys, no longer gets enough water. And the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee are flooded with toxic lake water. Leave them lights as they are And keep your clothes on I've had more than my film Of whiskey and women And good-hearted villains But there's a wickedness in me still Keep that gun locked away Locked away, boy Will you know you're an angry young man Going in town with six rounds You're sure to be hellbound That house you got's built on the sand The only reason I wasn't born in the Keys was because Hurricane Donna hit and uh, tore up the infrastructure and I uh, had to go to South Miami Hospital. Other than that, my whole life, yes. Right in this area, actually, right in Isla Mirada. I still live in the same neighborhood I grew up in, 57 years later, so. But when I was a kid, 16, 15, 14 years old, whatever, we'd go around any of the islands in the middle part of the bay and you can pull around the island and you'd see snook cruising, you'd see redfish cruising, you'd see them tailed on the flats. I remember shutting down on a flat several times where as far as you can see is tailing redfish. I haven't caught a redfish and I can't tell you the last redfish I caught, unfortunately, so it's been a while. Even in the back country? Even in the back, oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, the back country is nothing like it was when I was growing up here. I mean, nothing like it was. And our water here used to be gin clear where you could go places and you'd, you could see the fish in the water. The bay is, is, is a series of contained basins, so there's not a whole lot of communication, hydrologically speaking, between parts of the bay and say the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. The biggest example of what happens when we go into a drought year is that the bay becomes uh, what we call hypersaline. So those basins turn into giant evaporative pans and we end up, especially in the central part of the bay, the part of the bay that's least flushed, most contained, will get salinities that are one and a half times that of sea level. Uh, you know, at that point you're talking 50 in, I think, even up to close to 60 parts per thousand in some basins. There's not much can live in that salt content. In the worst case scenarios, and I've seen both of these events, one occurred in uh, between 1987 and 92, and then the last one was in 2015-16, we see these massive seagrass die-offs, which literally means that about 10 or 20 percent of the bay bottom which has this lush seagrasses in it that you know kind of wave to you off the bottom those all die this flat actually runs all the way over to the no motor zone that we were just up against corpus point on and it uh, used to be just solid grass across here beautiful clean water both tides didn't really matter now, as soon as this water starts coming in, you can see it carries all the mud across there. You can see how light color that bottom is now. It's because there's no grass up there anymore, so. Well, when they die, they decompose. When they decompose, they put nutrients in the water. When they put nutrients in the water, something's going to consume that nutrients, and invariably, it's an algal bloom, which then smothers more seagrass, takes the oxygen out of the water, kills the fish. Without the fish, the things that eat fish can't survive either, and you end up with a giant ecological cascade to the negative. Um, and I, I, when that happened again two years ago or three years ago, um, it was heartbreaking that we let that happen a second time. Um, I shouldn't have to watch that twice in my lifetime. Nobody should. And I'm watching it die right here in front of me, and it's not a good feeling. This isn't just a place for me to go to work. This is where I grew up. I live, I was married in the Bay. My father died in the Bay in 75 in a plane crash. 
Uh, I have at least uh, 10 friends of mine whose ashes were spread in the Florida Bay in different areas. Still a beautiful place, don't get me wrong. It's still beautiful, but it is nothing like what it could be with a little bit of help and a little bit of TLC. I was hoping, you know, everybody says, how long are you going to fish for? I said, well, until I fall off the back of the boat and I can't get in it, you know. But now I don't see that. I don't see myself retiring as a, as a skiff guide in Isla Mirada for sure. I'm going to have to go somewhere else eventually. Hopefully uh, not for a while, but you never know. So you've seen where the water doesn't go. Here's where it does. The county was supposed to start at like back. Yeah, I heard that. I mean, I'm kind of interested in yeah, that. Yeah, I kind of feel like they waited too long. I'm like, it's all starting to kind of go away now. It's a little way too reactive. Push right there. Can you show me what you have sitting in that cardboard box over there? Oh. <laughs> now, this isn't part of uh, what we felt like was going to be, uh, you know, our, our standard, uh, you know, dress code. Um, but what we were looking uh, at when we, uh, we we had to close our office was it was the reality if we couldn't get our servers connected to our editors and our art department um, off-site, we were gonna have to wear masks at our office desks in order to continue to work here. New at 11 making a big move because potentially toxic algae just feet from their doorstep. Another Martin County business is closing up shop for now, but not because of their bottom line. Megan McRoberts live to explain why it's all about health concerns. Megan? Michael Kelly staff here at the Florida Sportsman magazine office put this sign on their door today saying they are closed because of what they call toxic algae fumes. They say that nearby algae is something they can smell inside the office and they're worried about their health. This is not too unlike what we've had to do with previous hurricanes. Shutter the windows and figure out how we're going to bring magazines to the press working remotely. Publisher Blair Wickstrom says they'll be working remotely for weeks, but if this blue green algae doesn't wash away, they might choose a new location. Unlike an act of God, they're running from a man-made problem. Where does it come from? The, uh, you know, there's been this debate on, on where this, this toxic algae comes from and, and who and what is responsible for it. But in the case of uh, uh, what we've got in the St. Lucie estuary, it's very clear where the, the algae comes from. Uh, they had satellite imagery uh, in early July of the Lake Okeechobee, 90% covered in algae balloon. Uh, they opened the gates and we have algae. During the summer, when lake temperatures soar, phosphorus and nitrogen from years of cattle, urban, and sugar farm runoff feed this toxic algae like they would a sugarcane crop. And it grows out of control. Yet the water is still allowed to be discharged into the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee. You can't manage billions of gallons of water, millions of gallons a day. It's too much to manage in terms of trying to capture and screen and filter the water at that point. So, you know, man, I can say this, I just took this directly from Lake Okeechobee because I'm telling you how much nutrients <laughs> going into Lake Okeechobee from agribusiness. So that is? That's blue-green algae right there. <laughs> and when we say toxic blue-green algae, what are we actually referring to? Okay, these blue-green algae, that is probably like 10,000 species. Um, and there's a wide variety of different types of toxins that are produced by various species. Probably the best known one is microcystin, and it causes short-term gastrointestinal problems, some neurological problems, 
but it's been found it can also lead to uh, long-term liver cancer, things like that. Oh, I think this is Clusatchee River. Now, again, this is old. It used to be green like that, and it sort of died off now. I'll be dumping it soon. And there's a bunch of other toxins produced by various species of blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, um, have somewhat similar symptoms. And then more recently, we've discovered a compound called BMAA, an unusual amino acid, and it gets in the place of serine in proteins, and so it screws up the three-dimensional structure of proteins. And so when that happens in your brain cells, brain cells can't get rid of them and these, these form protein tangles because the proteins don't fold up properly. And they slowly clog up your brain cells until they eventually die, which is a characteristic of these neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. This is why people were being tested that one day, Florida sportsmen. They worked on this river and breathed in its toxic fumes. Researchers will use their blood samples as a baseline for microcystin and BMAA concentrations. Instead of us spending our Friday night, you know, watching the, the moon come up and the sun go down, um, just relaxing, that hadn't happened. You know, it, it's just one of those things where your life is impacted, you move on, but you realize that you are leaving the things that you really felt were important and why we moved here, and we're no longer doing them. At this point, you're probably wondering how this water is allowed to be put into the rivers. Well, discharges from the south are done primarily to benefit the communities for flood control. You don't do that from the farm fields, it's from the communities. Farmers have never had openings into the lake, the ability to move water into the lake. It's always been done by the agency in charge of water flow in the South Florida, which is the Water Management District. Right. But guess who, although unofficially, controls the Water Management District? Right as the district was finally about to crack down on agricultural pollution, Irene Quincy, a former 16-year Water Management District employee and now current U.S. sugar lobbyist, slips into the picture. Although she arrived only five days before the plan was due, the district made an exception and gave her an extra month to edit what they wrote. The end result? The district weakened their own ability to regulate phosphorus pollution at Lake O, the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee rivers, because they allowed De Quincy to delete the word enforceable in multiple places. Additionally, all references were deleted to a $650,000 study that zeroed in on pollution around the lake. Why would a government organization dedicated to improving water quality reduce their ability to monitor it? Well, the South Florida Water Management District is appointed by the Florida governor. Attorneys for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection say that once Governor Rick Scott took office back in 2011, they were told not to use the words climate change or global warming. We just could say the water is getting hotter. We couldn't talk about why the water was getting hotter. At some point it was mentioned that sea level rise was to be referred to as nuisance flooding. This is the same governor who cut South Florida Water Management District budgets by $700 million and Florida Department of Environmental Protection budgets by $150 million. The same governor who repealed inspection requirements for septic tanks in people's homes, which allowed bacteria from our shit to flow right into our waterways and then fuel algae blooms. The same governor that opposed EPA federal water regulations designed to make polluters like sugar pay. Scott's anti-environmental record really starts to make sense when you look into his campaign donations. These are no family farms we're dealing with, but two huge corporations. But this may be a more flagrant example of Scott's connection to sugar. In February 2013, his third year as Florida governor, 
got to go on a hunting trip to King's Ranch. All expenses were paid by Florida sugar industry down to the hunting licenses. Not to mention the land they were on was 30,000 acres leased by U.S. Sugar. If the collusion wasn't already apparent, Scott then decided to appoint an executive from King's Ranch to the South Florida Water Management District. This doesn't sound so believable now, does it? Never. Farmers have never had openings into the lake, the ability to move water into the lake. It's always been done by the agency in charge of water flow in the South Florida, which is the water management Florida's district. Opponent, Bill McCollum. He's owned by, special, uh, by uh, U.S. Sugar. I mean, they've, they've given him nearly a million dollars uh, for his campaign. And, you know, it's, it's disgusting. Marianne Moran from the Tea Party in Action asked candidates to sign a pledge against the deal. So far, Rick Scott is the only one in the governor's race to do so. Right after insulting his opponent for taking too much money from U.S. Sugar, Scott goes and signs a pledge swearing he'll never purchase any of their land, which would be used for Everglades restoration as long as he's appointed governor. What's scary about this whole thing is how easy politicians are to flip. And he's not alone. We're in Sebring at the Inn on the Lakes in Highlands County, the heartland of the state of Florida. That's Adam Putnam, Florida's commissioner of agriculture and want to be governor. But here's where it gets tricky. The $865,000 from the sugar industry were donated directly to Adam Putnam's political action committee called Florida Grown. To escape the public eye and make this figure bigger, they can go to other political action committees, which will then donate to Florida Grown. And look what happens. This brings Putnam's numbers to 9.2 million from the sugar industry. Rick Scott's probably looks more like this too, and that's just the bottom. But none of this comes as any surprise, as 57.8 million was the total for direct contributions in only 22 years. But as we've learned, that's just a fraction of it when you have the pack work around. All of these political donations make the biggest difference though, when it comes to one policy. I had a conversation just a couple weeks back with the South Florida Water Management District. I asked them about the ecology of the lake. They said the optimum level of the lake for its ecology is at minimum 11 feet. And I asked them, okay, if the water level on the lake should not be below 11 feet, if the lake was at 11 feet, would you still send the water to the irrigation canals for agriculture? The answer was yes. If it was at 10 feet, would you still send the water to the, to the canals for ir agricultural irrigation? The answer was yes. If it was at 9 feet, the answer was yes. If the lake was at 8 feet, a dangerously low level, the answer was yes. They would still get their water for those purposes. So is it right that you keep the water at this higher level when my community is destroyed because this water is at that higher level, when you're still gonna send the water to these other areas for their purposes, even if the water is down as low as eight feet on Lake Okeechobee? As a direct result of Sugar's political intervention, Congress instructs the Army Corps of Engineers to keep lake levels between 12 and a half and 15 and a half feet. The extra water acts like an insurance policy. In years where there's not enough water, they have plenty in the lake. And in years where there's too much water, they just discharge it. And this happens. I haven't been fishing in three months. I usually fish twice a week. The river's dead. There's a question always in the back of your mind is, uh, do you want to get out now? Health-wise or economically? I mean, it affects it all. I sit here and I'm watching you, but I'm looking out the window at the water, you know, that's what I, and I see it, it right now, it's, it, 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 it's full of green algae. You know, you gotta be careful with your kids because they really don't know the consequences of what this green algae can do and the long-term effects of it. 
And as a, as a parent, as a father, I gotta say, until they know and then they, until they can definitively tell me, um, there's no way I'm letting my kids near it. You know, just, it's not normal. It's, it's not a normal song for them, you know? They're usually out in the pool, but you take them out in the pool and, and right now it stinks, you know? It, it just the smell, if, if the wind comes up right, and it's just nasty. I can't even put it into words, man. It's so nasty. It makes you just want to instantly vomit. <laughs> this represents death. spot usually and we've gone through a bunch all the way from Cape Coral, South Cape Coral all the way up to North Port Myers. Every canal. Thought that green slime was nasty? Wait until you see what Darcy and others on the west coast had to deal with on top of it. It is my livelihood. This is how I've raised four kids, put them through school and everything is fishing. I mean, that's what I chose for life, you know. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I, I would do it again if I was starting today. It continues to happen and, and the severity of the red tide, then our fish population, you know, changes, then I'll have to relocate. I'll have to move from a place that I've been in for 30 years now. There's a new proactive approach to cleaning up red tide debris on our beaches. Crews in Pinellas County, they have now picked up 66,000 pounds of dead fish. ABC Action News reporter Jasmine Stiles is in Madeira Beach with a look at this new strategy. There's nothing they can do about the stench, but the hundreds of dead fish washing up on shore, here's their solution. Karenia brevis, also called red tide is another form of toxic algae. Just about any living thing in the water will be paralyzed by its brevitoxins. When I looked at the data over the last 50 years, it became clear to me that it's gotten much worse than it used to be. On average, about 15 times worse than it was 50 years ago. You're releasing all this water from Lake Okeechobee down the Clusiachi River and out into the estuary and out into the Gulf of Mexico now. And those are freshwater blue-green algae. They die, and when they die, they release the nutrients, and that just goes right into the red tide. So not only do Lake Okeechobee discharges bring the nasty green slime, but they also feed the catastrophic red tide. Its scope is difficult to understand. Maybe this will help. And these are just two of more than 400 sea turtles found in this area alone. There really isn't much help in cleaning up this mess. Madeira Beach has one of the highest concentrations of red tide in the Bay Area. The county hired contractors to work on land and on the water.
Rockwell says it had 16,791 rooms canceled. to describe how it smells. Crews in Lee County have now collected more than 3 million pounds of dead fish from our local beaches. And just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, the Gulf Stream current carried red tide to the east coast. And the same thing happened. As of late October, both of Florida's coasts are still inundated by red tide. The darker the spot, the more intense the concentration. And if Dr. Brandt's theory is correct about blue-green algae from discharges feeding the red tide, sugar could be in big trouble. But they've tried to stop signs before. Can you talk about what happened in 2003 when you uh, returned to your lab one day? Well, I, well, let's just say I've had a lot of problems. Uh, a lot of people are unhappy with my research conclusions. I mean, uh, well, let's just leave it at that. A lot of people are unhappy, and so I've run into a lot of problems in trying to continue my research. When Dr. Brand returned to his lab that day with some samples, he found it completely empty. Years of research gone, and $100,000 worth of equipment nowhere to be found. One little clue might help this all make sense. And that's how Alfie Fanhul is on the University of Miami Board of Trustees. Alfie Fanhul serves as chairman of the board and CEO of both the Fanhul Corporation and Florida Crystals, where they farm 190,000 acres in Palm Beach County. Did I forget to mention that Alfie is a brother? Pepe Fanhul is vice chairman, chief operating officer, and president of the companies. They are joined tonight by many of their family members and teammates who've made that success possible. Please sit back and enjoy this video story. What they lack in physical intimidation, they make up for in sheer amount of money they spend. When Trump came to Miami for his 2016 campaign, Pepe held him a fundraiser. We are going to win the great state of Florida. And then when Hillary strolled into town for the same thing, Alfie held her a fundraiser. The fan holes couldn't care less about who actually wins because they play both sides. It's been like that for a long time now. The sugar companies have been cozy with the Bushes, they've been cozy with the Clintons. Uh, they take uh, state politicians on private secretive hunting trips to a private ranch in, uh, in Texas, and then guess what? The politicians come back and usually do what sugar wants them to. This happened in 96, when the 1.4 billion annual sugar subsidy was up for review. It's part of the farm bill and forces domestic prices to be twice the world price. On President's Day of that year, an intern named Monica Lewinsky recalled Clinton talking to somebody named Finuli. Hello, White House. Records show that Clinton spoke to Alfie Fanhul from 12.42 to 1.04. And no changes were made to the farm bill after that. To this day, those price supports remain and Sugar's land is far too valuable for them to consider selling. And unfortunately, 
their land is the key to fixing this entire mess. But sugar and the environment can coexist. If they sold 200,000 of their 700,000 acres, there would be enough water to send south like the old days to save Florida Bay. And since the water would be going south, it wouldn't need to be headed east and west where it causes all the devastation. Well, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have any hope. But we need to take human health and, and the house we live in into consideration and clean up the mess. And the only way to do that is to elect the people. People that do not fear big sugar. They don't fear what they can do in, in, in their campaign, what kind of money they can bring to their campaign, because it doesn't matter. Because if they don't do the right thing, people will vote them out of office. Because water in Florida, that's what it's all about. Florida isn't about sugar cane, it's about water. My job is to, to educate the people of what they're doing. The more I educate them, the more they enjoy it and get into it, the more we can protect what I, I chose to make a living doing and live around. Simple fix which uh, needs to be protected. Now you could die from eating too much sugar, but you're not going to die from spending too much time in the Florida Bay, I can tell you that right now. In order to reverse this and get this back, we need politicians who will stand up to the sugarcane industry and help restore the Everglades' natural flow. It's not a hard problem, but there's a lot of politics standing in the way. So go vote. I didn't want to spend the last six months of my life doing this. I just wanted to make a fly fishing film. But the places that I love were at risk, and I needed to do something about it. Florida's not completely gone yet. It's still beautiful. The fish are still there. And it's still my home.